Good morning, church. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. My name is Amy. I'm one of the pastors here at First Christian. And this morning we were thrown a couple of curveballs, weren't we? I don't know about you, but when I stuck my arm out of my comforter in bed this morning, I put it back underneath. It's too cold. So those of you who showed up are, are brave. It was a beautiful spring thus far, and I don't know, Mother Nature changed her mind this morning, reversed time or something. Um, another curveball, you may notice that Josh isn't up here today. Um, he's sick. Um, I know, poor Josh, if you're watching, actually I hope you're resting, Josh, but if you watch this later, we love you, we miss you, take care of yourself. Pastor Austin caught the curveball, and he, uh, what, about <laughs> an hour ago? We're going to have to sing loud today. <laughs> We're glad that you're up here. We're grateful for all of you, and it'll be great. It'll be great. You got a curveball, too, didn't you? Uh, I just yeah. realized. I looked around. It's a joy. It's a hey, joy. that's okay. Um, we're here together to lift up love and then to be held by love. So we surrender to that love in this time. We lift up our hearts to God. Um, as Pastor Justin brings in the light of Christ, <laughs> another curveball, <laughs> let us stand and worship God together. Church, would you pray with me this morning? God, on days when we wake up and it is cold and rainy and when there's been a few curveballs, remind us that we are held. Remind us that you are here. That you are here when the sun shines and that you are here on the cloudy days when it rains. 
that you are here in our joys and in our sorrows, that you are here, that your spirit moves in between and among us, that your love overwhelms us. God, remind us. Remind us through our smiles and through our hugs. Remind us through our tears. Remind us to hold one another. God, we pray for the names on our list that, that have been added this week. We pray for Dan and Kathy Scheffel, for Lori Hall, and for Marcus Templeton. God, we pray as your son prayed. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
for this praise. Too. And I got to tell you, there, there is a, uh, so you could imagine uh, working in a church office, a very common question is, what are we going to do if, right? And uh, around this place, I'll tell you that, uh, that the answer pretty much every time we ask that question is Austin. <laughs> what, what are we going to do? What are we going to do if this? Austin. What are we going to do if this? Austin. What are we going to He's like the, uh, the Swiss army knife of a ministerial <laughs> staff, right? We thank you. We love you. Appreciate your ministry among us, friend. All right, we are, uh, we are in week two of our study that we're calling uh, You Have Heard It Said, right? Talking about the six statements, the antitheses, statements of Jesus expanding on people's legalistic sort of understanding of righteousness in the Old Testament. Jesus is trying to get us to see that it's not just about following the rules, okay? It's about a whole new mindset, a, a kingdom-centered mindset, recognizing that we're part of something bigger now, right? We need, a, we, we need not just to follow the rules, but we need a deeper way of, 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 of thinking, a, a, a deeper way of being in relationship that serves for us as a perpetual source of faithful action throughout everything we do in this life, okay? I, I'm going to raise again the question. I, I, I framed this question in week one of the series. I'm going to keep asking it throughout the study. I want you to continue to wrestle with this as we move through the study together. If Jesus gave the same speech today... What kind of themes do you think he might have focused on? What are, what are those areas where we tend maybe to focus on the letter of the law and miss the spirit of the law that stands at the center of, of Christ's hopes for us? All right. I got to tell you this, too. Amy and Austin are both going to preach at, at some point during this series, but I am so fortunate and blessed that I drew the topic for today— if you've read this text in advance, you know what I'm talking about. Um, I'm going to talk about the second and third antitheses here, which both kind of connect and are focused on here in Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 through 32. Are you ready now? Here we go. Let's, re let's read Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 through 32. You have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust, I think we could add man in there too, right? Uh, everyone who looks at a person with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out, throw it away. It's better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. Verse 31, it was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of unchastity causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. That'll be all for today. <laughs> this is the word of God for the people of God, and together we say, thanks be to God. All right, here we go. Uh, we are, let's talk about the second one of those things first, okay, this divorce topic. And I, I want to acknowledge, before we even get started here, that I know this is a very personal topic for many people in the room, probably half of us. Uh, have been through that, and I can't even imagine how, how painful um, that was for you. If you're going through that now, how painful that might be for you right now. And, and I just, I just want to be clear right out of the gate in saying that, that if that has been or if that is your experience, God loves you no less. God loves you no less, and you are no less in the kingdom than, than anybody else. Okay, having said that, the truth is, you know, the church has often been unkind 
in its history to people going through that experience. And, uh, and I think the irony here is that Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount is trying to shift us away from a sort of legalistic understanding of things, and, and yet this is itself one of those passages that we might tend to kind of read in a, a legalistic sort of way. Now the key, the key to understanding this passage is in recognizing that in the ancient world, Okay, in the, in the world into which these texts were written, the world had a very different understanding of human relationship dynamics and especially uh, different understanding in terms of marriage. Okay, I, I want to claim to you today that this passage actually has more to do, we're going to talk about this, more to do with God's view of the worth of human beings and especially women okay, than it does with rules about divorce or anything else. I'm going to say that one more time. This passage has more to do with God's understanding and God's hopes for God's created world when it comes to the worth of human beings, and especially women, than it has to do with rules about divorce. Jesus says, you've heard it said, Whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. He is quoting from Deuteronomy 24, okay, which is itself, which was itself revolutionary in its time, okay? Men of the ancient world, now you, you better hear me saying this is, this is not what Justin believes. This is what men of the ancient world thought, okay? Men of the ancient world thought that... Women, their wives, were their property. Men thought their wife was their property, and they could do whatever they chose with her. They could discard her for any reason, uh, whenever they wanted to, for any reason whatsoever. And in Hebrew society, unless a woman had a certificate of divorce, after that divorce, she was not allowed to remarry. Okay? And the truth is, if, you are, if you're a woman living in Hebrew society at that time, and your husband, for, for whatever whimsical reason, he decides to divorce you, decides to, to discard you and divorce you, uh, and doesn't, for whatever reason, have the grace and dignity of giving you this certificate of divorce, you couldn't remarry. And because in that society, uh, a woman wasn't really able to, to, to work, what would happen to a woman in this situation? She would be on the streets, okay? Deuteronomy 24, again, revolutionary in its time, says, hey, fellas, you need to think about her and what's best for her, okay? And at the very least, if you are going to divorce her, you need to give her this certificate of divorce so that she will be free to marry again and not be on the streets, right? But over time, what do the men do? What do the men do as they, as they hear this, this point of the law? They focus on the letter of that commandment and miss the spirit of it, right? Hmm. They check the box of giving her this certificate of divorce, but they still, mm, they still don't really have her interests at heart, right? It's, it's still about still about doing whatever they want, and then they just kind of justify themselves by saying, well, I checked the box. You know, I, I checked, I gave her the certificate. I, I, I did what the law says, and they justify themselves in that way. And Jesus comes along and says, whoa, hold on now. Hold up now. It's not just about doing the right thing by giving her this certificate. That's just a piece of paper. It's bigger than that. You need to take a step back, fellas, and you need to question your motivations, and you need to think not just about what you want, but what's best for her. The bond of marriage, he says, is sacred. It's sacred. This is that 
that shift in mindset, and, and this, by the way, pervades this entire section of the text that we're reading, this, this Sermon on the Mount, these, these six antitheses, this mindset shift from a me-centered perspective to a we-centered perspective. Not all marriages work out. Not all marriages work out. Okay, we are not a called, we are not called, and the text, the text says this, we're not called to abide adultery, we're not called to abide abuse, but we are called to give it everything we've got, because it matters. Okay, the, these, these covenants that we enter into as human beings, they matter. We're called to give it everything we've got. I stood in this room yesterday and had the privilege and the blessing of celebrating Ray and Reba Johnson, some of you were here yesterday for that. Uh, wonderful couple. If you aren't aware of their story, they were, they were married for 61 years. Uh, Reba died on March the 2nd, and Ray, who had been in perfect health, died on March the 22nd. Just like that. And uh, we talked about how we stood in awe of, of the depth of the connection that the two of them had, and and uh, the fact that while we, while we grieve and lament their passing, uh, what, a, what a holy thing it is that the two of them have entered after 20 days apart physically, have entered the next phase of their journey together in wholeness. And these are, these are the last uh, words that I shared yesterday as part of the eulogy. I was talking about the last time I saw them together, uh, had the chance to go sit with them in their home, and... Uh, and, and watch the two of them interact and see the love they had for one another. And, uh, and Reba talked about the amazing ways that Ray had taken care of her, how, how he had given everything to focus his life on her care in the last days, the last years of her life. And then Ray looked over at her, this is, this is how I closed yesterday. Ray looked over at her, speaking as he so often did, not with his mouth, he was a quiet man, but with a look of love in his eyes. Voiceless voice, <coughs> wordless words, speaking the deepest truth of his heart. I love you, Reba, and I always will. I would follow you to the ends of the earth and across the valley of the shadow of death and into the very heart of God. And so he did. That's what we're talking about here, y'all. These, these covenants that we enter into as human beings, the covenant of marriage, the covenant of church, these are sacred. All right, now let's get back to the first half of the text. Look at this again now. Uh, first couple of verses here. You shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, of the six antitheses, this might be the one that the most people just roll their eyes at. Okay? Of, of all six of these, uh, this is the one that, uh, that maybe we pay the least credence to, surely, surely Jesus doesn't really mean that. Surely he doesn't mean that. Come on, surely, preacher, there's, there's some historical context on this one to free me from what feels like a completely impossible call, right? Alas, Katie shaking her, no, no. Alas, there is a difference between learning context, church, learning the context of these texts to give us a deeper understanding of the text, and then looking for, for some sort of alternative interpretation because we just don't like what a text has to say. Hmm. As much as I hate to say it, and as much as probably everybody in this room has been guilty of this at one point or another in our lives, hmm, alas, I think this is one of those texts that pretty straightforward. Okay? You can't help finding someone attractive 
And, and there are few things in this life, very few things in this life, with greater ability to uncenter us, to untether us from our center, and to spin us out into a cycle of personal destruction and death and lust. There are few things that will spin us out and untether us more quickly, more powerfully than lust. And as I reflected on this this week, I prayed to God, Lord, help me figure out what sermon illustration I'm going to use for this. There's few things I could tell you, there's few stories I could tell that wouldn't somehow be some kind of breach of confidentiality and trust, okay? But I do, I do remember, I do have an image uh, that I hold in my mind as a reminder of what you look like when you give yourself over to lust, okay? Where, where you kind of end up when you, when you do that. I was working at a, at a gym, a uh, summer job in college. Uh, that's when I got huge, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and spent a summer working there. And there was this one day when there was this old gentleman named Buzz. Okay, and Buzz was a, you know, he was, I think he was in his 70s. I think he was former military. And, and you know, a lot of fellows that have, fellows and women who have been in military are maybe better at, at, uh, at staying physically fit than some of the rest of us. And so Buzz was one of those fellows, and he was on the treadmill that morning, you know, and he was getting after it. I mean, he was running. He had the thing cranked up to 10, you know, and a sprinting. And this young woman named Debbie walked into the gym, and she was an attractive woman, okay? And she was walking by over here and was going to pass behind Buzz. And Buzz was, you know, he's running, and he starts to do this. Hey! And is staring her down in a way that I'm sure made her extremely uncomfortable, okay? Here's this old man on the treadmill. Now, here's the thing. She, she's she's going to walk behind him to go over there somewhere on that side of the gym. And if you have ever run full speed on a treadmill, there is one rule. What do you never do? You never look behind you, okay? So Buzz is watching Debbie, yeah, you know, just, just giving her that... And, and then she kind of gets over behind him, and he's watching her go. And before you know it, that treadmill spits him out. <laughs> whoosh, straight back. And he lays pancaked on the floor right in front of her. <laughs> and he's laying on the ground going, ah, 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 ah. That's the image I carry <laughs> of where lust gets you. Okay, it'll get you on the floor behind the treadmill with everybody looking at you like you're a fool. <sighs> Friends, what do both of these antitheses have in common? These two sections of the Sermon on the Mount here. Remember, this whole section is about shifting our mindset from a legalistic understanding of the faith to an emerging kingdom of Christ understanding of things. I think it's been our tendency to read this legalistically. And I want to propose to you today that this passage isn't just about, it isn't just about what you should and shouldn't do. You're divorced, oh, shame on you. You can't be part of this church. You looked at him or her lustfully, bad boy, bad girl. We'll get you a chastity belt, okay? This isn't about shame. It isn't about guilt. It isn't even about following the rules. It's about learning to see people differently. It's about learning to see people differently. Jesus is saying, if you want to live fully, if you want to live fully in this life, you need to learn to see the world the way that I see the world. In my view, Jesus says, people are not means to an end. People do not exist for your satisfaction. People, are, I'll, I'll stand here and say it all day, people are not means 
to your personal ends. They're children of God. They're shaped in God's image, and they are worthy of dignity and respect. The message isn't that divorce is evil. The message is that marriage is serious, right? It's a big deal to be in covenant with someone. If you're married, maybe that's an important thing for you to hear. If you're divorced, you're divorced. Life happens, okay? Here you are. The question for you is not, you know, can you continue to feel guilty? It's not about that. It's not about the guilt. It's not about the shame. It's about how you can best be in covenant now with the people that you're in covenant with. If you're remarried, you're in a new covenant. What does that look like? If you're not, you're in covenant with the church. What does that look like? How can we be in covenant with each other and take that seriously? Similarly, the first part of the text, the message isn't walk around with blinders on so you don't notice beautiful people. Okay? The message is when you see an attractive person, you need to see beyond surface level things. Look at that person and remember their worth as a human being and treat them accordingly. I had the privilege of serving with a, with a pastor in California, and uh, he was a wonderful man, and, and he, was, he was walking. I heard this story years later from another person in the church who thought it was incredibly special. So he was, he was walking on the street one day in Studio City, uh, where the church was and is, and a, a working woman uh, approached him and started talking about, you know, what $100 could get him, Okay. And, uh, and he took out his phone, and he said, just a second, let me, let me make a phone call, okay? And she got kind of nervous, uh, probably afraid he was going to call the police. And he said, no, no, it's okay, I'm not, I'm not calling the police, let me make a phone call. And he walked over, and he called his wife. And about three or four minutes later, she pulled up in her car, and she picked them both up. And they said, we'll give you $100 to come have dinner with us. And they took her home, and they made her a wonderful dinner. And they shared conversation with her. And they got to know her. And, and they heard about the challenges of her journey and how she had lost both of her parents when she was young. And the last I heard, she had gotten her GED and was beginning school to become a dental hygienist. And she said, people always looked at me, for whatever reasons, in judgment, in lust, people always looked at me, but it was the first time I could remember that someone saw me. She's a child of God, and so is every person you meet on the street. And so are you. In our Sunday school class, we hold up questions. The name of the class is holding the questions appropriately. And last week we asked, what does it mean to love ourselves? And I asked the room, how many of us growing up, whether it was in Sunday school or with our teachers in kindergarten or at home with our parents, were taught how to love ourselves? No hands including mine. But wait a minute. Doesn't Jesus say that just after loving the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, the very next law of love is to love our neighbor what? As ourselves. And just as 
Pastor Justin said, we have to learn to see differently. I think we have to love ourselves first. How else might we be able to offer love to anyone else? How did we miss this, church? This covenant, this holy promise to embody love is to surrender to it, to trust that we are held by it, that we might truly learn to be held, and then we can behold others. Jesus' message of love, it's about letting go. But instead, we have made it to be about taking in and attaining and performing and winning and succeeding. Too often we may attach this love to the wrong things, to other people, to our own self-image, to our desire for security or control. But at this table, we remember the Passover. When Jesus gathered with his friends to celebrate God's redeeming grace, when the angel of death hovers over, they are held together by love. So we practice every week. I don't think we can get enough practice. Today, as you receive <coughs> this meal, be held and be loved. We remember the night that Jesus gathered with his friends, the disciples. He took bread, he gave thanks for it, and he broke it. <coughs> Giving it to them, he took his life in his own hands, and he gave it to them saying, this is my body, broken open for you. Eat this and remember me. In the same way, he took a cup, and after giving thanks for it also, he poured it out. And he gave it to them saying, this is my lifeblood, all that I have and all that I am poured out for you, poured into you, that you would have new life in me, that you would receive love and be held by it. Let us pray. Be gracious unto us and bless us, O Lord. We lift our hearts to you in humility and trust. When we're paralyzed by fear or apathy, may we feel the living Christ inviting us to be whole again. We come to this table knowing that Christ is the living water, the healing presence, the caring friend we need to help us stand on our feet again. Bless the bread and help us remember Christ as we eat the bread. Bless this cup and help us know the reality of a love that does not stop even at the cross. Let us go from here nourished and strengthened that we might be a blessing for others as we seek to serve you, Lord. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Come to the table and be held by love. All are welcome.
Friends, we are given the gift in Christ of the opportunity to see the world, to experience life in, in a whole new way, uh, to set aside uh, me-centered thinking and give ourselves over into we-centered thinking, to participate in this amazing, beautiful thing that God is doing through Christ upon this earth. And the call is new every day to practice seeing life, to practice seeing people in a new way, in, in, uh, in, in the way of, of, of Christ, uh, looking through that, that lens of kingdom. If you would choose that way today for the first time, um, or if you're looking for a faith family where you can continue in that challenging journey of being transformed and renewed daily by Christ, we would love to invite you forward uh, that we might receive you, celebrate that with you. Would you stand as your able friends in body or spirit? We're going to sing together one more time. What are we singing, Pastor? How great is our God. Amen. Amen. Let's sing it. Now may the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Abba, Father, the fellowship, the power, the communion of the Holy Spirit, be with us and abide with us now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, church.